My guest is Derek Jensen, author of nearly 30 books, including Endgame, The Problem of Civilization, A Language Older Than Words, and Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What You Can Do About It, with co-authors Lear Keith and Max Wilbur. Derek, how are you today? I'm okay. How are you doing? Doing great, thanks. So I wanted to ask you about a, a thought experiment that you uh, bring up in uh, Bright Green Lies, which is that, you know, would it be better for cars to get 100 miles to the gallon or one mile to the gallon? Most people would say it would, it would obviously be better if cars got 100 miles to the gallon because, you know, less carbon emissions, that kind of thing. What do you think? Well, that was actually written by... Uh, Max, and when he wrote it, I uh, I read it, and I fell into the, the same trap that we all would when I'm reading it. It's like, obviously, it's better for the environment for them to get 100 miles per, per gallon. Um, and then he made this convincing argument, which is, um, which ties into something called Jevons Paradox. And Jevons Paradox is that Jevons was a, a economist in the 19th century who studied the coal problem and and one of his the things one of the things for which he's most famous is that if you increase efficiency with which coal is used that you would think that that would make coal use go down because you have to use less of it if you have a you, if you design some sort of coal furnace that can heat for the same amount for half the usage of coal, that should drive the usage down because you're only using half. But it ends up that it's the opposite, that if you increase efficiency, it actually increases demand. And that's because you find more uses for it. And the way that applies, and then this, this, this ends up applying, they've done a study of, I don't know, 120, 124 uh, different um, materials. And it's true for all of them that if you find a way to use um, gasoline more effectively, if you find a way to use uh, dish soap more effectively, it doesn't matter, dish soap I'm making up, but um, you know, various raw materials, that, that increases demand. So, so think about this with a car, that if you have a car that goes 100 miles per gallon, you'll use it a lot more and you'll actually use a lot more gas. If you have one that'll go one mile per gallon, you're going to really limit the number of trips you do. And a great example of this from the book is one day I was in town and there's this really good taco shop that I wanted to go to that's about, oh, I don't know, five miles north. And um, I was thinking about this because I just read it from Max. And, you know, as much as I like tacos and these tacos there's no way i would want to drive you know use 10 gallons of gas to get there that's 60 you know it's six bucks a gallon that's 60 bucks extra for the tacos i'm not going to do it but if the gas was you know if i'm if it's only going to cost me a tenth of a gallon that's 60 cents yeah i'll add that to it and so the point that that max is making with that and that we end up making with that is that none of car culture would exist if you only got one mile per gallon so on a superficial level uh sure it would be better for the environment but it would really be better for the environment if people weren't buying cars and if people weren't i mean a, another example from my own life is i routinely uh instead of going to instead of putting my trash out at the corner i go, I take my own trash to the dump. And, you know, that's, I don't know, five miles of the dump and five miles back. And so if that cost an extra 60 bucks per trip, I wouldn't do it. I would, you know, have the, the city do it. So those are just simple examples of how, how increased efficiency actually leads, actually leads to increased usage. Right. So in your book, Endgame, Problem of Civilization, you make the case that civilization is inherently unsustainable. So what is civilization and what makes it unsustainable? 
Well, civilization um, is any way of life that's really based on the growth of cities. And that definition of civilization is defensible both linguistically and historically. Civilization comes from the root kivitetas, which means state or city. When we talk about the rise of civilizations, we always talk about the, we, we talk constantly about how that started with the first cities. And what is a city? And to think about what, to, what a city is, we have to, I mean, I, ha, I always go back to a conversation I had when I was a baby environmentalist with um, a, a friend and environmental mentor, John, John Osborne, who we were sitting at, at dinner and he took a napkin and he put a little circle and he said, that's the city. And he put a bigger circle. He said, that's the area where the city draws resources. And as the city grows, it will take resources from an ever larger area. And you know, I, I, let's go back to my definition. Civilization is a way of life based on the growth of cities. That's nice, but what's a city? And a city I've defined is people living in numbers large enough to require the importation of resources. And two things happen as soon as you have to require the importation of resources. One of them is that your way of life will never be sustainable because if you require the importation of resources, it means you've denuded the landscape of that particular resource. And the only way to live sustainably is to live live in such a way that you don't harm the land where you live. Because if you harm it a little bit every year, then that means eventually, you know, after a hundred years, a thousand years, you, it, you'll, you'll have destroyed it. And another way to say this is that if you have people living such that you require the importation of resources, you've overshot carrying capacity. And that's one thing that it means is your way of life can never be sustainable. And the other thing that it means is that your way of life has to be based on violence because if you require the importation of resources and the people in the next watershed over won't trade you for it, you'll, you'll take them because you require them. And that's really the history of civilization in a very short description that it has harmed the land where, where it is. And then they have a choice. They can either collapse or they can, uh, conquer their neighbors. And that has been what civilizations have done is conquer their neighbors and destroy their land. Um, and then you conquer their neighbors and you have an advantage when you do this because you are, um, you, if you have destroyed the land to increase human population, you will have a class of soldiers who can then help conquer. And also you've converted your land base into weapons of war, which will give you an advantage. And that's, that's not a theoretical, ha theoretical example. The, the North Africa used to be heavily forced and those went down to make the Egyptian and Phoenician navies. And that's happened around the world. Um, so cities are really based on, which, and think about this just in terms of, any city you want. I mean, where where does the food come from New, for New York City? Where does the uh, wood come from? Where do the bricks come from? Where does it all has to be imported? It all has to be brought in from somewhere else. And then where does where do the waste go? Where does the poop go? And in the case of New York City, where the poop goes used to be in the ocean. And now it goes, it's trucked by railroad down to Alabama. There's a county down there that they can't go outside anymore because it stinks so bad from all the poop from New York City. And it's got to go somewhere. Um, so uh, something I find disheartening is that none of this analysis is cognitively challenging and nor is any of it new. Um, we have Mencius uh, a couple thousand years ago in China talking about how the hill used to be covered, the mountain used to be covered with trees, but now because the city has grown, uh, the hill is, is no longer has any trees. And um, the first written myth of Western civilization is Gilgamesh deforesting Iraq to build a great city. And I mean, none of this is new. We have ancient Greek philosophers were complaining that deforestation was harming water quality. Um, anyway, so, so that's what is, that's what a civilization is. And that's how, um, and that's why on a, and another thing I was trying to do with that is a language older than words. I talked about how 
this culture has psychological problems. And in culture make-believe, I approach it from sort of a sociological perspective that the system of social rewards is going to lead inevitably to atrocity. And then um, I wanted to approach it on a different level because you can argue psychology and you can argue sociology, but you can't really argue resource movement. You know, you can't argue that importing things from mines is uh, things from mines is sustainable. And one quick example of that is I was getting interviewed by this guy from Nature magazine several years ago who was a dedicated Marxist who believed that it was possible to have an industrial economy that is based on purely voluntary exchanges. No, no human gets exploited. And he didn't care about the natural world at all. And so I said, great, do you have cities? And he said, yes. I said, how do you get around in your cities? He said, by bus. I said, great, what are the buses made of? He said, metal. I said, great, so you do recognize that mining is such a miserable existence that it was one of the first forms of slavery. So we just pay them a lot. I said, okay, I, I don't really agree with you, but I'll grant you that. Um, but every hard rock mine on the planet pollutes groundwater. So what do you do with the people who are uh, living next to the river that is next to the mine? And he said, we pay them to leave. And I said, what if they don't want to leave? He said, you pay them more. And I said, well, what if their ancestors are buried there and this is their home and they refuse to leave? And he said, well, how many are there? I said, I don't know, 500. He said, well, the million people in the city vote and they vote that those 500 people have to leave and then you kick them off. And I said, oh, great. So you've gone from purely voluntary exchanges to democratic empire, land theft from indigenous people and genocide all within less than a minute. So you can have a bus. And those are inherent in that's inherent in overshoot. There's you, you can't really argue this. What do you think about hope? Um, well, there are two types of hope that I want to talk about. The first is, um, is false hope. And I think that those need to be ruthlessly eradicated. If, you know, one of the reasons my mother stayed with my father is because there weren't battered women shelters in the fifties and sixties, but another reason is because of the false hope that he would change and false hopes, I think are almost never helpful unless you are completely powerless. Like I can understand, you know, I used to teach at a prison, uh, Supermax prison. Many of these students were in for the rest of their lives. And I could see why a lot of them would um, convert to a fundamentalist religion because your life is over here. There's, <clears throat> there is no hope. You have no power. So, well, maybe after I die, things will be okay. And I can totally see that. Um, but if you're not completely powerless, then um, I think we should get rid of false hopes as much as we can. And, you know, does anybody really think that a Democrat in the White House is good for the environment? Um, does anybody really think that wind and solar are going to save the planet? I mean, it's a false hope. And, and, you know, for the most part, even the advocates of wind and solar are explicit about this. They're not trying to save the planet. I just saw an article a couple of days ago by Michael Mann about this is our last chance to save civilization. They're attempting to save this way of life. They're not trying to save the planet. They're quite explicit about this. Anyway, so I think false hopes are, they bind us to unlivable situations and they blind us to real possibilities. So we need to ruthlessly eradicate false hope. But then there's hope itself. I was bashing hope at a talk maybe 20 years ago and somebody in the audience shouted out, what's your definition of hope? And I said, I don't know, I, I, let's, let's come up with one. And the audience and I together came up with a definition of hope, which is, which I really like, which is hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. And that's how we use it in everyday language. I don't hope that I eat something later today. I'm just, I'm going to, on the other hand, the next time I get on a plane, I hope it doesn't crash mm -hmm. because I have no agency once I'm in the air. And I was doing a talk once and someone came up to me and said, are you telling me I can't hope my brother survives his cancer? I said, no, I'm not telling you that at all. What I'm telling you is that you can't stand there with car keys in your hand and say, I hope you make it to the hospital. So what I'm really getting at with that is trying to figure out what we do and don't have agency over. So for example, with salmon, what salmon need to survive 
are for uh, dams to be removed, for industrial fishing to stop, industrial logging to stop, for uh, the oceans not to be murdered, and for global warming to stop. And if that doesn't, uh, if if you are not working for those, and you say, "I hope they survive," that's just meaningless. Um, but then, where hope can come in is if you do those, if you remove the dams, if you stop the logging, if you stop the fishing, if you stop the murder of the planet, murder the oceans, and you stop the the stop global warming, then you have to hope that the that the salmon and the rivers do their job um, because that's out of our control, but it's what we can and can't control. So it's, it's what I'm getting at with that is figuring out what, what is, uh, what you have agency over and figuring out the places where you do have power and then, and then doing something about it. You know, I can say, I just interviewed a guy last week who is working to try to stop uh, horse racing for being cruel to horses. And he, you know, he could simply say, I hope horse racing stops, but that's not what he's doing. What he's doing is everything in his power to, to stop it. Um, and so a lot of people have misunderstood that essay that I, they, they say that I'm against hope, but I'm not against hope at all. I'm, I, I think that hope is a very important thing in ways, that, in ways having to do with, with you not having power. Another great example of this is I was doing a talk one time and some of the audience asked me about hope. My mom was in the audience and I said, look, when I was a kid, I could have, my mom could have said to me, clean your room. And I could have said, yeah, I hope the room gets clean. And we would have all recognized that that's ridiculous. And I said that to my mom in the audience. And I said, what would you have said if I would have told you, I hope the room gets clean. And she said, I would have said back to you, yeah, you better hope it gets clean. And the point is that we all know that somebody has to actually clean the room. But when it comes to these larger issues, it's like we we go, I hope that this, I hope the planet survives global warming. I hope that the planet survives this or that. And yeah, I hope it survives too. But but that only comes after I do everything I can. Right. I mean, if you're, if you're playing sports, you don't really go, I hope we win. You do your best to win. And then after that, you got to hope you win. What's the true state of the environmental movement today? Well, I, I think it's not in very good shape. And one reason I don't think it's in very good shape is i mean one example of this is in the 90s there was still a movement for zero cut on um on public lands for for no timber cutting at all on public lands and these days there are, exist environmental organizations that um that uh write the timber sales for the forest service and we've just gone backwards in so many ways. And that's one thing. And another part of the problem is that uh, the environmental movement has, um, much of the environmental movement has completely bought into wind and solar. So they've become de facto uh, lobbying arms for the wind and solar industries. Um, and a great example of that is you can get a million people marching on the streets of New York City or Paris or 100,000 people marching on the streets of New York City or Paris, any of these cities, 10,000 people, however many people. And if you ask them why they're marching, they'll say to protect the planet. And if you ask them for their demands, their demands are for subsidies for the wind and solar industries. And I can't think of any other movement like this that has been turned into a lobbying arm for a sector of capitalism. And then another problem is that from the from the uh, back in the early 90s and late 80s, one thing I fought quite a bit was this right wing notion that um, because humans are natural, therefore, because humans evolved, therefore, everything humans create is natural. 
therefore chainsaws are natural, therefore clear cuts are natural, therefore parking lots are natural. And it was just sophistry. We all know the difference between a parking lot and, and a forest. And what it's really getting at, and then there also there was the argument that from the right wing that a managed forest is a healthy forest, that these forests need us to manage them, otherwise they'll fall apart. And you know, this always at the time made me wonder how did they ever survive for millions of years without us there? So that was from the right wing. And these days there is the equivalent argument is coming from the left, which is that, so the old argument was everything is na everything is natural because humans are natural, therefore everything we do is natural. Now the new argument is basically, it gets to the same point that forests need to be managed, but it comes from the opposite direction. It is from the left and it is that uh, there is no such thing as wild nature. There is no such thing as a wild forest. Um, they argue that humans created everything. There's a book several years ago that was just dreadful called um, The Rambunctious Garden, which was about how the entire world has been managed by humans. And there are arguments made that the Amazon rainforest, I just saw one the other day, uh, the, the Amazon rainforest is a human creation um, and the, basically a giant garden. And the reason for the, the recent argument was because there are certain sorts of soil that were made by humans, therefore the Amazon is, but it's ridiculous. Of course, everybody affects the land where they are, but nobody ever talks about Brazil nuts creating the Amazon rainforest and Brazil nuts are incredibly important as are the creatures who eat them and then excrete them to to move those trees around. And it's only humans who in this case are really the managers. And there's this argument again from the, from the uh, left that uh, we need to manage the whole world. And it comes down to the same thing. And it's really important in both cases because in both cases, the argument is, not, is that nature is not self-willed. And nature does not know how to take care of its own forest. But forests have been taking care of themselves for a long, long time. They don't need to be burned by humans. They don't need to be cut by humans. And they're introducing fire in places where there was never fire. And they're also using the excuse that because Indians burned uh, around their villages in some places in the United States, that therefore you have to burn in places that were never burned. It's just, it's all an excuse for logging. One of the smartest smartest essays I ever wrote was back in the 90s. Um, I had recently interviewed Robert J. Lifton, who wrote The Nazi Doctors, who's one of the, the, the major statements he made that really influenced me was, before you can commit any mass atrocity, you have to convince yourself and others that what you're doing is not an atrocity, but a good thing. You have to have what he called a claim to virtue. And so the Nazis, from their own perspective, weren't in fact committing mass murder and genocide, they were purifying the Aryan race. The Nazis weren't waging aggressive war. They were taking the Lebensraum, the living space that they needed. Um, capitalists today aren't destroying the planet. They are developing natural resources. Um, the people who put in wind and solar aren't killing the planet. They are uh, saving civilization. You know, there's always a claim to virgin. This is true in my own personal life too. I've never once in my life been a jerk. You know, every time I've objectively been a jerk, I've had it completely rationalized. We all do. It's, that's that's the point of this claims to virtue stuff is that we are really good at rationalization. But the, the the point having to do with the essay I wrote in the '90s was I was asked by this alternative newspaper to write a rebuttal to the notion that um, salvage logging is what they called it at the time, or or logging for forest health. He he said. Logging for forest health just seems like such a no-brainer to me. It seems so obvious we should do it. So you write about that. And logging for forest health is you go in and, and you clear-cut an area that's sick or in, threatened by insects or something, and then that's supposed to help the forest. And it's just, I don't know why the editor thought this was a good idea, but I'm, I'm thinking about the article, and then it occurs to me that 
that's this is all claims to virtue that that they have had the forest service etc have all had successive claims to virtue on why the forests need to be cut down uh at one point it was for for homes at one point it was for uh economic development at one point it was for jobs even though the cut was going up and jobs were going down because of raw log exports and automation um and then after that it was the forests are in a state of collapse so we need to cut them down for forest health another claim to virtue has been we need to cut them down because um because they're rotting and if they rot then the wood will go to waste and the more recent one that's been going for the last 20 years has been fuel reduction that we need to cut them down so they don't burn and it's just a claim to virtue i don't want to say one more thing about that which is that um there's a, a place burned about 20 miles northeast of here and uh it's a fire dependent forest and everybody's freaking out about what a terrible burn it is how we need to cut down the forest to prevent these but i i drove through it and this is what a fire dependent forest is supposed to look like it's supposed to have places that are that are burned there'll be five acres burned right here and then there'll be areas that are mixed with some dead trees some live trees and then there's areas over here where it's, it's it's a mosaic and this is what's supposed to happen these forests evolved with it such that there are there are woodpeckers called black backed woodpeckers and the reason they got black backs is because that makes a camouflage against dead burned trees. Mm -hmm. it's, there are trees, lodgepole pines, who won't, uh, their cones won't pop until, until there's a fire. Mm -hmm. It's just, they evolved with this. This is, this is, it's just madness that we're using. So the environmental movement, the, the point of this whole long story is the environmental movement has gone from zero cut a movement for zero cut back in the 90s to now um they're actually arguing for cutting in the national parks and um it's just it's it's horrific um and we've lost our biocentrism um there's there's uh there are um, i want to be really clear when i say this i'm not talking about individuals and I'm not talking about small grassroots organizations, many of which are quite, quite good. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about as a whole, it is, uh, I mean, it was, we, we I also shouldn't talk, and when we, especially when we talk about the large ones, I shouldn't talk about any sort of golden age because I remember reading uh, back in the 90s exposés of um, the head of National Wildlife Federation left that job and immediately became a PR flack for Plum Creek Timber Company. Um, so this sort of revolving door between industry and big green uh, has been going on for a long time. Um, but at least there was, I think that was a, there was a stronger fight going on for biocentrism before. And that's, that's absent from much again, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about individual activists. I'm not talking about uh, small organizations. There are plenty of really good small organizations and they're pretty good. There are plenty of, there is even some pretty good uh, medium-sized organizations that are still biocentric. Here's a quote from you. It reminds me of what you're saying now is that in order to maintain our way of living, we must tell lies to each other and especially to ourselves that's from your book end game that's from language all the words actually okay yeah that was the first sentence of that book when i first wrote it and it pretty much summarizes everything about my entire 28 books i mean that's just that's, 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 um yeah and that that Yeah, so what do you want me to say about it? Well, I could go on to, like, we could talk about the media. Like, you, you frequently quote this, and I, I've started to frequently quote this as well. Uh, the press, is it from Henry Francis Adams, who was a big-name historian, great-grandson of John Adams, John, uh, grandson of John Quincy Adams, son of Charles Francis Adams, ambassador to the UK under Lincoln, and he said the press and who wrote this 
highly acclaimed nine-volume history of the Jefferson and Adams, Jefferson and Madison administrations. He says, the press is the hired agent of a muddied system and set up for no other purpose than to tell lies where their interests are involved. So it seems to me that, yes, we do tell lies to each other and we're all complicit, but some are more complicit than others. And uh, it would be great if the average environmentalist, for one thing, were truly aware of what's really going on but we have this media system that is constantly feeding us lies that, you know, so. Yeah, I first became aware of this. I didn't hear about that quote until my 30s, but I first became aware of the problem when I was in college. And I realized that almost any time a journalist wrote about something that I knew intimately, they got it wrong. Hmm. And I didn't that disturbed me but and then so you know sometimes i thought that that was just um accidents that you know they're trained as journalists they're not trained as physicists they're not trained as historians so yeah they can they can get get stuff wrong and it's not really their fault and then i remember uh Another big moment for me was when George Will, I don't know if you remember him, he was a yeah. columnist. Uh, he wrote one of Reagan's speeches and then as a columnist praised how great the speech was. And that just struck me as fundamentally corrupt. And and then later through the 80s, there was this whole big spotted owls versus jobs debate. And the the media portrayal of it was that spotted owls were costing jobs. But like I said earlier, the cut was going up on, on federal lands, but jobs were going down because of raw log exports and automation. And the journalists never talked about this. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it, I to this day I don't really understand. You know, there are mistakes I've made in my writing. There are things I've gotten incorrect, but I have never intentionally lied. I, I I'm not expecting any any writer or anybody to never make mistakes. We we all, you know, no matter what your field is, if you're building a bridge or if you're um, writing a book or if you're fixing a car, sometimes you mess up. And I would say messing up in a book is probably the least important between those three because, you know, if you're building a bridge and you mess up, you could kill people. And that's not what I'm talking about. Um, it's, it's this, you know, I, I interviewed Dick Manning in 1989 who has written a number of good books, including Against the Grain. He's, he's, he's a good writer. And I interviewed him just after he had been fired from the Missoulian uh, for writing a timber series. And the timber series, uh, he got fired because he was, quote, too close to the issue. And he said, in any other field, this is called cultivating your sources. But when mm -hmm. it comes to protecting the environment, you can't love the environment. And then later, several years later, there was a, uh, I lived in Spokane and there was a, a pretty good series came out uh, through the Spokesman Review, which was generally not a very good paper, but it came out that was quite good on forest issues. And I happened to talk to one of the journalists and he said, you know, we never could have done an expose like this of the car dealerships because the car dealerships put such huge ads in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just everywhere that, and it, it, for me, at least writing is a sacred task that my, I, I attempt to tell the truth the best I can. And I don't understand. I mean, two things I don't understand. One is I don't, I mean, even though I've written about this for so many books, I still don't really get it. And just yesterday, I saw 
I mean, this, this doesn't have to do with the press, but it has to do with something that I, I don't understand in general, even though I've written books about it, is I, I saw a video of a police stop, a police, a police officer stopped uh, a guy, guy's driving, and then there's a, a woman in the passenger seat, and the cop is holding a gun on the, the man in the driver's seat and says, don't move, I see the gun in your lap. So don't move your hands, don't move your hands. And first off, the guy does move his hands and ends up getting shot. But the thing I want to get to is that the woman is screaming, he didn't have a gun, he didn't have a gun. And in the video, you can see the gun on his lap. I, and I don't, I don't understand. I mean, this is like 1984 territory, mm -hmm. except she's doing it on a personal level, mm -hmm. as opposed to, it's the same happening on a larger scale. But I mean, everybody knows that you can't, you can't mine your way to environmental sustainability, yet the bright green movement is calling for massive increases in mining. And I, I like, you know, early on, I said that this, none of this is cognitively challenging. It's not, it's not hard to figure out that if there are uncountable salmon and then you can count them and then there's 500,000 and then there's 300,000 and there's 100,000 and that's going the wrong direction. It's not, you know, a joke I used to tell is, um, I'm going to, you know, they say one sign of intelligence is the ability to recognize patterns. I'm going to lay out a pattern. Let's see if we can recognize it in less than 6,000 years. And that's, you know, then I go through all the places that have been deforested by this culture. And so, yeah, I mean, there, there is this corruption on the, I mean, the level of press and the, the press is set up to serve the owning class. That's absolutely true. And then another part of it is that we all participate in this level of denial. And, you know, Mumford would probably, if he were, if he were sitting on this conversation, he would probably argue that part of the reason that we go along with all these obvious lies is because we have computers and because we get goodies from it. We get access to ice cream 24 seven. We get access to good health care. We get access to instantaneous communication and travel. And that's what he called the magnificent bribe. That's why we're giving up everything is because we've been bought off. And, you know, I was just having a discussion with somebody the other day about how, um, he was saying, you know, we don't really want to bring down civilization because that will kill a lot of people. And I was saying every species on the planet, except for humans, would rejoice if civilization came down. And in fact, poor humans would be better off any, yeah. right, right away. Exactly. There's like a, a third of humans on the planet don't have electricity. You think they care if the grid goes down? Right. They'd be better um, off. Yeah, they'd be better off. And years ago, I asked um, both Anurata Mittal, former director of Food First, and also um, Vandana Shiva, if the people of India would be better off if the global economy disappeared. And they gave examples of former granaries of India that now export dog food and tulips to Europe. And I said, what about the poor people in the, in the cities? And they said, the reason the poor people are in the cities in the first place is because they've been driven off their land. And, you know, it's the same. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I got interviewed a couple of years ago by somebody about immigration. Well, one of the questions about immigration and part of my response was that the reason that there is so much immigration is because to the United States is not because the people want to leave Honduras, yeah, leave their homes. It's because the, the land has been taken for export crops. Right. And yeah. So, so, and part of another part of the problem here is like Daniel Quinn said that we are dependent for our very lives on the system that's destroying the planet. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with a very mixed loyalty um, because I'm, I'm, my life is dependent on, on high tech medicine. And, and then we're, most of us, almost all of us are dependent for food on the system that brings it to us, um, which doesn't alter the fact that it's all unsustainable and I think we should start from that recognition and 
move on from there. Right. You have a quote from, well, from your end game talk. Any way of living that is based on the use of non-renewable resources will not last. And in fact, any way of living that is based on the hyper exploitation of renewable resources will not last. And one of the examples that you gave in conjunction with that was a public official whose name escapes me, um, but he, he was confronted with the idea that 90% of large fish have been lost. And he said, well, we have to define an acceptable level of decline, um, you know, that kind of thing. So apparently a 90% loss of large fish was an acceptable level of decline in his view. Yeah, it's, um, I don't, and I don't, that, that again is the sort of, um, 1984 style uh, double think that I don't understand how more people don't see through, even with the Magnificent Bride. That I mean, and that's another part of this is that when you mess with the oceans on this level, it's all over. This is an ocean planet. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to, you know, if you were to to die and be reincarnated as a random animal tomorrow chances are pretty good you'd be living in the ocean and um i don't i don't but i guess the word i'm looking for with all of this is cognitive dissonance that i i don't you know a, a couple of days ago i gave a, a talk a sort of q a talk and one of the questions that was asked to me that i was not particularly happy with my answer was um they asked about the relationship between mental health crisis and uh, climate crisis. And I, I answered some stuff that was okay, but I didn't really hit the cognitive dissonance that when, when you're lied to constantly, when what you see before your eyes is constantly denied, of course that's going to lead to a mental health crisis. That's even ignoring the fact that most of us don't get to be in nature at all. And that leads to a mental health crisis as well. It's, but I, I, I don't, I don't think we, this is one of the things that, that one of the ways I became an environmentalist in the first place is I didn't understand the distinction. Well, it's, I didn't understand how anybody could believe in infinite growth on a finite planet. It just, it just, I understood that as a kid mm -hmm. and so I, I think that having to tell these lies all the time creates these splits in your psyche that, uh, well, that's one part. Another part that I didn't mention the other night that, that I think is really important to all this is, you know, that guy, the 90%, he's not only uh, denying it or denying that it's important, but also I remember I read this book a few years ago that, that really part of it very, moved me very much. It was 13 Moons by uh, Charles Frazier. He's the guy who wrote Cold Mountain. And the primary plot is a love story between a man and a woman, which was okay. But the part I really liked was a love story between that man and the land. And it was set in North Carolina from 1820 to 1900. And there's a soliloquy that the guy has at the end about how Humans evolved losing those they love. Your parents die, your grandparents die, your parents die, your friends die, your ex-lovers die, you know, everybody dies until, you know, if you're not the one who dies, then you're the last one standing. And we evolved with that. But through all of that, there was the continuity of community and the continuity of the land. And there is no place in our hearts and no place in our evolution for, so, you know, you and I live in the same community and then, you know, our parents die and our older siblings die and everybody dies and individual trees die, but the forest is still here. Individual salmon die, but the river is still here. But that's not what we're living in now. What we're living in now is 
that the places we love. I don't know anybody who wants to go back to where they grew up because it's been devastated. Right. And there's a, a, a wonderful movie from 80s or 90s um, based on a play from the 40s or 50s called Trip to Bountiful. And it's about this old woman who wants to go back to where she was when she was younger one final time. And uh, the movie is set outside of Houston. And I re-saw that. My mom loved that movie. We watched it again as she was dying. And I was thinking, there's no way they can make that movie today because she would go back to this beautiful place, Bountiful, and it'd be a shopping mall. You know, it wouldn't be the fields of bluebells anymore. And there's no place in our heart for that level. There's no place in our minds for the comprehension of 90% of the large fish in the oceans being gone. I want to recommend something to, to everybody who's listening to this, which is there's a book called Sea of Slaughter by Farley Mowat that I really want to recommend people read. Basically what it is, for the most part, is contemporary accounts of what North America was like prior to conquest. And how do you spell Mowat? M-O-W-A-T. Okay. Farley is F-A-R-L-E-Y, Sea of Slaughter. And it's the accounts, like there are places where there were so many whales that the, that the water always looked foggy because of their breath. And there would be so many whales that the air would stink because evidently whales have pretty bad breath and to us and the air itself would stink from their breath and there were so many whales they were a hazard to shipping and there were so many fish in the hudson river that they would carry off people's nets and you know we've all heard of the passenger pigeons that they were so thick in the sky that um the sky would be darkened for days at a time and the when the europe when the when the spanish explorers first saw san francisco bay they said that it was, quote, paved in sea lions. And if you were in California, this is not from that book, from a different one. If you were in California 400 years ago, 300 years ago, if you were within, if you were next to a body of water, you would probably see a grizzly bear every 15 minutes. And I mean, seeing a grizzly bear would be less exciting than seeing a mosquito now, you know, unless you live in Minnesota, in which case you mm -hmm. see more than a mosquito every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't see a mosquito every 15 minutes here. Um, and anyway, the, the, the world was just incredibly, unbelievably fecund before, before all of this. And well, I don't I like think saying, there's a place in the hearts for yeah. that. I'm sorry, go ahead. I like saying who, who decided, like I always use water, who decided that polluted water was the price of progress with the idea being that you know, we didn't decide that. It was decided by a few people. And it's the same thing. Who decided that it was acceptable to get rid of all the whales, the sea lions the, uh, that you're talking about? The, so, Yeah, I mean, we talk about freedom of choice and how we as Americans get to choose and you can't take away our rights. Uh, you can't take away my right to have Wi-Fi or whatever. But they've taken away my right to see a passenger pigeon or to eat a passenger pigeon for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, and they've taken away my right to, um, I mean, cod were so thick in the Atlantic that people would, would put down buckets and just pull them back up with fish. It was, it was unbelievable, but I wouldn't believe it if somebody just said it now, but they said it back then. It's like, oh yeah, we want, we wanted to catch some fish. So we just put a bucket in, we pulled it up and there was fish in it. Like, who does that? Where can you do that now? And this isn't even that long ago. My great grandmother, yeah, my great grandmother, my mom's grandma, she uh, grew up on a sod house in the prairie of Nebraska. And um, when she was a little girl, she would get afraid whenever there would be thunder and lightning because she was afraid the buffalo would stampede and run over her out her home. Mm -hmm. And it's like, who's afraid of buffalo stampeding and running over your house at this point? Right. Um, and that's only, you know, that's my great grandmother. That's that's not even that long. It's extraordinary to me how fast all of this has gone. You know, it was only 120 years ago that the runs of salmon were even here. The runs of salmon less than 100 years ago were so thick that that you couldn't see the bottom of the river. And 
you know, they're, they're pretty much gone now. It's, it's, um, and who decides? Um, you know, it's interesting. On one hand, it is a few people who decide. And on another hand, um, William Catton in his book Overshoot talks about how a whole bunch of people acting in their own self-interest collectively is what he calls fate. That that's part of the problem is that the, the, the logic of capitalism and the logic of self-interest are so addictive and so strong that it's very hard to resist. And there are a couple examples of that. One is um, I read a book on the history of the Mississippi a couple of years ago. And um, within about 20 years of the introduction of metal pots to the upper Mississippi, a couple thousand year tradition of pottery had disappeared. Because there's no reason, to, make, there's no reason to, to, to go through all the trouble of making pottery right. that can break right. if you can buy a metal pot for cheap. And then likewise, the main, the, the main killers of beaver for the fur trade in the 19th century, 18th and 19th centuries, were actually the Indians. And when somebody first told me that, I was like, oh my gosh, George, that's really racist to say. It's like, first off, history isn't racist. It's just true. Mm -hmm. And second, what this shows is the addictiveness of consumer culture, that there were groups who believed that the beavers were their grandparents. They would never kill a beaver because it's, you know, that's grandma. But when it came time to get a steel knife, um, yeah, sure, I'll kill grandma for the steel knife. Um, that's a lot easier than chipping one out of stone, and it's a lot more effective. And all that says to me is the incredible addictiveness of the dominant culture. It also makes very clear the relationship between technology and spirituality that they don't exist separately, hmm. that um, if you want to destroy someone's perception of the world as sacred, all you have to do is make it in their economic best interest to not see the world as sacred. And that's not, I'm not blaming the Indians. We, we went through that before. I mean, that's what, that's what a lot of people have written about the industrial revolution did that I'm sorry, the scientific revolution did is it desacralized the planet and it turned it into raw material for us to use. And that's, that is an incredibly addictive process. And by the way, the word addict, I, I, I love the word addict because it comes from the same root as the word edict. And it means to enslave because a judge would issue an edict addicting someone to someone else that's enslaving someone to somebody else and that's true for addiction you know there's the, there's that great line about um you know the alcoholic stopped drinking from the bottle and the bottle started drinking from him mm. and technology is not just serving us we're serving technology and we become yeah, so we we cre we create technology and there's this idea that technology is neutral it can be used for good or bad we don't even usually get to that part because there's usually this blanket assumption that technology is good and then there's a fallback notion that says technology can be good or bad but the reality in my understanding my observation uh lewis mumford would uh, kind of had developed this idea, and that is that we create the technology, but then technology shapes society and our lives to the extent that, you know, the technology is in charge. It's no longer neutral, let alone benign. Well, think about it. Um, are cities designed for human beings or for cars? And the entire economy. <laughs> we, right. We, we talk about this, um, you know, the government takes better care of corporations than it does human beings. Yeah. We all know this. And corporations are human creations. They're, they're, they don't even exist. I mean, they're, they are what Lewis Mumford would call mega machines. Um, they are simply a form of technology, a, a intellectual form of technology. And, um, and governments serve them better than they serve humans. And, you know, we, we get all nervous. It's like, Okay, let's pretend the bright greens were right and that it's fossil fuel that are killing the planet. Um, 
they're not all fossil fuel has done is speed it up mm -hmm. i'm not saying fossil fuels are okay but mm -hmm. they're not the cause they're just right. a fuel anyway an accelerant and let's pretend though that the bright greens are right um and that all we needed to do to stop global warming is to stop burning fossil fuels i don't see it happening fossil fuel users are higher than they've ever been it's like who's in charge and the fossil fuel industry is in charge and and technology is in charge and it's just and this is true on a personal level too you know it's it's um alul wrote about how uh no was it alul oh god i don't remember who it was now somebody wrote about how if you who was the anti-tech philosopher who lived in mexico I don't know. Anyway, I don't remember either, obviously. Um, anyway, he said that if you if you uh, add up the number of hours that people spend paying for a car and paying for insurance and paying mm -hmm. for everything associated with the car, and then you pay them a wage to do that, basically, I mean, that you figure out how much and then how far they, they drive, it ends up that basically if you took all the hours that you spent working to buy the car, you're only traveling like four miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is convenient to be able to drive, you know, to the grocery store right now, but you've spent a lot of time working to make that so it happens. And we organize, you know, society gets organized around this technology. Yep. And I, I like saying, you know, um, so in almost any circle, including environmental circles, if you question civilization if you suggest like you know your friend george said the stone age was the only level of technology that's sustainable then um I lost my train of thought there but the idea is uh don't you hate it when that happens but but okay here, here's the thing we are enslaved to the technology we work so many hours that civilization such as we know it does not necessarily give us freedom. You have to look at what we've lost. You have to look at what it costs us to sustain civilization. And I like thinking that we spend our work hours, at least many of us, much of the time, spend our work hours fashioning the chains that bind us. We manufacture the chains that bind us in, in terms of you know the, what you said about cars, the way we have to spend 25 years paying off, 30 years paying off the mortgage on a house, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's not even to talk about the cost to the humans or non-humans in the future. Exactly. Who right. are going to inherit a completely impoverished world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it, it's, I think the question of who's in charge is really important. And I think who is being served by this and have you ever heard of stafford beer no uh he was a british um business professor and posiwid is an acronym for the purpose of a system is what it does hmm. so if you want to know what a system if you want to know the purpose of a system look at the results and the outcomes don't listen to the rhetoric Look at the results and outcomes. Yep. So when you said that the uh, government, well, when you said that you know government assiduously attends to the needs of corporations, well, that then that that you're you're looking at the purpose because that's what it does. So yeah, and I'm also you know thinking about you know the the U.S. economy is crapping out and. I was listening to this thing on NPR the other day about how there is a lot of money to be given to Ukraine. And it made me think of that line from early American history, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. tribute. What's, yeah. Tribute. tribute. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in many ways, the purpose of the system is war. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, do you do you remember in the '90s the peace dividend we were supposed to get? Oh yeah, the... absolutely. We believed that. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, you want to talk about a good way to make somebody cynical. Um, that was probably their mistake. Their mistake was they probably never should have talked about the peace dividend in the first place. Um, uh, can you give, for those younger people who may not know what that is, can you give like a 30-second peace dividend speech? Okay, so in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. In the early 90s, the Soviet Union, um, I, I think it voluntarily unwound uh, because it couldn't sustain itself. The, you know, the country of Russia couldn't maintain an empire that included all the Soviet satellites. So we like to, ref we Americans like to refer to it in these triumphalist terms, like the Soviet Union collapsed. But anyway, the Soviet Union came unwrapped. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, there wasn't this, you know, nuclear standoff between two superpowers and uh, the, uh, it's like, we won the Cold War. Um, and hey, if we want, we were spending all this money on the Cold War. Now we don't have to spend all this money on the Cold War because our enemy is gone. We're going to get a peace dividend. That was more than 30 seconds. Sorry. Then the peace dividend never happened. So continue your point. Oh, just we have to ask what, I mean, and likewise, the purpose of the system is to destroy the planet. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in if there is dissonance between rhetoric and reality, I'm a big believer in believing in reality. Yeah. And, you know, I can hear, you know, I've written about, you know, abusive dynamics and abusive parenting and all that. And, you know, they can say, I love you. They can say all this stuff, but you know, what are they doing? I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, the phrase where the rubber hits the road, except it's, of course it's a completely technified. Um, mm -hmm. And then another let's see, uh, peace dividend. Um, oh yeah. So when I was a little kid, I was, uh, I was, I was very right wing. When I was a young child, you know, it was raised Seventh day Adventist. And so I was all, you know, we have to, like, I, I was a kid during the Vietnam War. And it's like, you know, the, we're, we're fighting against communism, wh whatever that all means. But the interesting thing is, I read something when I was like 10 or 11. I read this thing that, okay, and I love reading military history. So that fascinates me. But I became, pretty strongly anti-military, even though I was still pretty right wing mm -hmm. at 10 or 11. And the thing that turned me over was just uh, a list. And it was a list of things that could have been bought by the United States government with, if I don't know, like 50% of the money that had gone to the military had gone to domestic spending instead. Mm -hmm. And it was, there could be a hospital a brand new hospital in every town bigger than 5,000 people. And there could be, you know, it's just, it's this extraordinary list of, of things that could have been accomplished. And then the other thing that really turned everything around for me is I read somewhere that it cost the United States government approximately, I think it was 500,000, might've been $50,000. It was a lot of money. Let's, let's call it 50 and be safe. $50,000 for every, uh, North Vietnamese soldier that was killed by the U.S. military, and it struck me, you know, forget the forget the the inhumanity of killing him. It struck me that in a country, I was reading this like ten or eleven back then, fifty thousand dollars was a lot more than it is now. Right, and this is in a com, com, country with a per capita income of, I don't know, let's just make up a number, five hundred bucks a year. I'm sure it was lower than that, but you could have gone to all of them and mm -hmm. said. Yeah. We'll hand you two years worth of wages if you like us. You know, we'll hand you a thousand bucks each. It just struck me as an economically ridiculous. There's all this money being spent to kill people when, I mean, it, it just struck me as absurd. And I'm like 10 or 11. And, and, and I also want to emphasize, I was still like pro-imperialist. It's like, it's okay for us to try to dominate their politics. It's just, this is a waste of money and life. 
And so I saw through that when I was really young. It's just incredibly, uh, oh, so much of this, this, this is where I've ended up being one of the few sort of modern people who has written fairly extensively about the culture having a death urge because so much of this stuff, okay, the world's commercial fishing fleets are subsidized to a value greater than the value of their catch. Doesn't make any sense to me. Right. We're actually all paying to destroy the oceans. Mm -hmm. This is it's it's nonsensical. Why don't we'd all be better off if they were just paid to stay home? You know, it's like this, and same with the Forest Service. They they have to lie and then they subsidize the timber sales. So we, the, the American public actually pays to destroy the forest. It's just <clears throat> the only way I can really understand this is that there is this. Well, I love the phrase you used about, um, you know, the purpose of the system is what it does. And, you know, the, the purpose of the Forest Service is to deforest, looking at it that way. And it's, and so then I, I just, I mean, what this, what civilization is, is a giant engine to consume the planet and turn the living planet. I mean, that's what, that's, that's what the measure of that's, that's how you measure GNP. What GNP is, is a measure of how quickly you have converted living beings into products. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, I was sharing the stage 15 years ago with Ward Churchill 20 years ago, some long time ago. And we're sitting backstage beforehand chatting and I'm commenting on how I find it was extraordinary and just stupid that the Germans kept such meticulous records of the Holocaust. And I mean, if you're gonna commit this horrible crime, which is terrible, I mean, you're also gonna keep meticulous records. And he just looked at me and said, Derek, what do you think GNP is? Hmm. And it's absolutely true. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, what is, you know, can we recognize this pattern in 6,000 years? You know, for, from the beginning, civilization has been deforesting has been destroying um wildlife um at this point i don't remember the numbers i think the technosphere weighs seven times as much as the biosphere the technosphere is all of our creations hmm. it actually weighs that. more than the entire biosphere hmm. and with terrestrial land mammals um humans and their pets and their livestock livestock weigh a lot more than pets humans livestock and pets weighs like i don't remember the number but it's like nine times as much as all the other terrestrial land mammals together um i don't remember the number i could be off you know by a factor i could be you know could be four could be 14 i don't remember but it's it's the point is that there's more it's just it's crazy and then you know one of the things that the anti-environmentalists used to say back in the 80s all the time and 90s was you know we need to strike a balance between the economy and environment and what they really mean is we've taken 98 percent. now we want to take 99 percent, and then 99 and a half and then 99 and three quarters i was like sure let's let's strike a balance let's um you know there's two million dams in the united states let's only take out a million of them this year and then you know there's there's seventy thousand dams there's two million dams total seventy thousand dams sixty thousand dams over 13 feet tall 70 thousand dams over six and a half feet tall and if we only took out one of those 70,000 dams every day, those are the ones that are over six and a half feet tall. It's a meter or two meters. If we only took out one of those every day, that would take 200 years. And so, yeah, I think that my suggestion of taking out one or five per year, I think that's pretty moderate. Because frankly, salmon don't have time and sturgeon don't have time, et cetera, et cetera. What have you uh, learned or observed or concluded about the psychology of humans that, you know, what would it take to influence humans? If there were a thousand Derek Jensen's uh, with, and with almost unlimited resources to communicate to the world, how would you go about it? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't even know how. I mean, the, the problem is that I'm not sure that most people change their minds based on evidence. Right. And 
Um, I think that the logic of addiction is pretty, pretty strong. And I think about this, even when it's not serving people that, um, I have known people who have been in relationships with abusers where they're getting punched in the face and they've been given options to get out and they don't do it. And I'm not blaming them because I understand. I mean, I've written about this extensively that, you know, Judith Herman has this great line about how when you're trying to help battered women get away, that often people on the outside are just frustrated by the seeming lack of power or the seeming lack of agency on those that they're trying to help get out. And the, the, when you've been beaten down for decades and when everything seems, uh, you know, when, when everything has been, when you have been forced to participate in your own degradation too, you know, your self-esteem can be so low. It, it has nothing to do with logic. We can all see you need to get out, but addictions are strong. And we've, we've known people who are addicted. We've all known people who were addicted to this or that, whether it's abusive relationship or whether it's, uh, you know, a drug or, or TV or consumerism or anything. And they can be really hard to break. And I don't, uh, So I, I think it's really hard to talk about. I mean, we've all we probably all have known people too who have been chain smokers. And you know, the the data on chain smoking and cancer gets pretty has been pretty strong and pretty well known for a long time. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I'm not blaming people here. I'm just saying that that I don't think that all of this is it's just a matter of convincing people. Um, okay, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. A part of that, or, or one of the things that I would, it, it occurs to me, you know, as somebody who would like to be able to influence people who tries and fails, uh, that loyalty to a social group is really strong. You know, and this comes up in political parties. It comes up in, no doubt, religious cults. It comes up in, I don't know, <laughs> sports, sports teams. Yeah. yeah. So that's part of it, I think. Yeah, I think humans are extremely social creatures. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, I, I'm, I, I think that we should, I don't know, I don't really know how we use, use that to, to go in the right direction. Uh, except to, to, to constantly advocate for what we think is right. And, um, and the degree to which, you know, I don't, I don't, I think all, I, I can't speak for other people, but all I can do is continue to tell the truth as I understand it to be. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a line from a thriller that first one through the door always gets shot. And, you know, that's true. Uh, the second one might get shot and the third one might get through. And um, I think that we need to just keep talking and keep expressing the truth as we can. And then that will encourage other people to also talk about what they, to, to talk about caring about wild nature more than, more than they do the culture. Derek, this has been a wonderful conversation. My guest has been Derek Jensen, uh, author of many books, not least of all, Bright Green Lies. I've been a climate reporter for five years, and uh, Bright Green Lies to me is the definitive work.